when the world is in crisis. And people are looking for hope and answers. Thai PBS World is there with you with the best minds of the day. Join us on Thai PBS World tonight, every weekdays at 7 p.m. Thai PBS World, we bring Thailand to the world. Good evening and welcome to Thai PBS World. I'm Tep Chai Yong. And I'm Nat Bunag. Now, by now, I think that uh, most people believe that a cabinet reshuffle is in order. But the question is when and how it will be done. And this is a question that even the Prime Minister himself still is reluctant to answer. <laughs> <laughs> but there is still a piece of good news because there are no new infections of COVID-19 today and no local transmissions as well. But speaking of the pandemic, the aftermath of it has put a huge impact on every single sector, including education, which has also been highly affected, not only the changes to the curriculum, but also the issues on inequality that still exist in Thailand. Today, there is an international conference on equitable education in which Her Royal Highness Prince her Royal Highness Princess Mahatakri Sirinton graciously presided over the opening ceremony and delivered a special lecture on this issue. Her Royal Highness Princess Mahatakri Sirinton presided over the opening ceremony of the International Conference on Equitable Education, All for Education 2020, at Siam Kempiski Hotel this morning. Her Royal Highness delivered a special lecture on 40 years of promoting equity in education and improving quality of lives for the disadvantaged children and youth. The lecture highlights the challenges of improving the quality of education amidst the pandemic, especially for children in remote areas and people with learning disabilities. This also includes examples of how Her Royal Highness and the Royal Family have contributed to enhance the equality of education. You have been working toward the goal of equitable education, all for education for years. Now we are challenged by the worst pandemic of our time caused by COVID-19, and it is seriously affect our children's education. And, uh, are we going to lose the battle this time? Now people talk about, encourage our young people to study, even in crisis like this. We have been through many obstacles before, like tsunami, big flood, and political unrest, and we have overcome some, though not all of them. Now people talk about online education, but in some places, children are too poor to have computers. Even one who do may find our courses not interesting. Some may not have good enough access to new teaching media. During the last flood, we distribute survival back with things that one could use without leaving the house for a few days. For children, we added survival bag for education. I cannot remember exactly what were in the bags. Now we are in COVID crisis, and we have also prepared survival bag for education. This time, the bag consists of self-learning kit called Teaching Media on the 60th birthday anniversary. It is set of instruction for Thai language and mathematics courses. In some villages, teaching clips are used, and children do their homework the teachers can grade the homework with help from volunteer messengers. In the back, we should also provide teaching media about COVID-19, exercise book, pencil, rubber, cloth masks, mung bean, and manual on how to grow bean sprout, some vegetable seeds, and family accounting bag. In this crisis, meals on wheels is not convenient, so we have to give families some material for cooking. School for girls. I learned that moms started this lecture, she also discussed the challenges working with children with mental disabilities as well as coming up with training courses for those who could not access the educational systems. Other than that, she also discussed about the challenges such as 
children living around temples are deprived with the quality of education, talking about other things as well, such as students in remote schools that experience malnutrition. So they have set up teaching, teaching them farming, growing vegetables, and raising animals so that they understand the, the whole cycle and to reduce the problem of malnutrition. And there, these are the things that have been discussed during the lecture as well. As for the International Conference on Equitable Education, All for Education 2020 is organized by the Equitable Education Fund, or the EEF, in collaboration with alliance partners, such as the Ministries of Education, Interior, Social, De Social Development and Human Security, UNESCO, UNICEF, World Bank, Global Partnership for Education, and Save the Children, UNESCO. So this is definitely a big conference on education and the equality. Yeah, it definitely is a challenge that the whole world has to work together to, to confront, not only Thailand, I think, because the pandemic has certainly wreaked havoc on the, not only on the people's daily life, but also on the future of the country, that is education. Definitely, because inequality still exists in Thailand, especially with the education, because in remote areas, uh, children seem to have lack of access to quality education, not just those in remote areas, but those with disabilities and those around temples who are commonly deprived of quality education when compared to schools in such cities as well. But, but during, this, during this lecture, Her Royal Highness also mentioned about education in prisons as well, wow. setting up libraries in prisons so that inmates can actually learn how to read and write, including computer classes besides teaching crafts as well. Okay. All right, now let's come to an issue that has become so common in Thailand now. That is the issue of uh, communities versus development which is a big, big challenge for developing countries like Thailand. In the southern province of Songkhla, tomorrow, there will be a public hearing on the large-scale industrial com complex project, which Thai authorities believe that will change the economic landscape of the region. And if successfully implemented, the authorities believe that it will drastically improve the livelihoods of the people in that part of the country and pave the way for a long-lasting solution to the years of violent conflicts in the three southernmost provinces. But many in the province see a different picture. For months, they have been waging a campaign against a project known as Jana Industrial Estate Project to be located in Jana District of Songkla Province. The opponents led by members of local communities are afraid that the project will destroy the pristine environment and ruin their livelihoods. They also argue that local communities have not been adequately consulted on the project, which they see as being imposed from the top down. But the project is not without its proponents. Many living in the same communities welcome it and are likely to go out in full force to voice their support for the project during tomorrow's hearing, which will be held on a school, camp on a school campus in Jana district. And with two opposing sides at the same forum, authorities see a potential of a confrontation which many are afraid could turn violent. Hundreds of policemen and security officials are being mobilized to maintain order at the site of the public hearing, which is expected to be attended by huge crowds from both sides. The project was approved by the cabinet in May last year. As the biggest industrial estate in the south, it will cover an area of more than 17,000 right in Jana district. The project gained little attention from people outside the areas until members of the so-called Jana Raktin network launched a campaign against it. Among them is Ms. Kariya Ramanya, a 17-year-old student from one of the villages that would be affected by the project. She has become the network's de facto spokeswoman after she and her mother came out at the Songkla provincial office for over 50 hours in May to highlight their opposition to the project. Last week, she and her fellow villagers submitted a letter to Prime Minister Bayu Chan 
through the Government House Complaint Center, calling on him to suspend the project and to organize a forum to hear views from opponents of the project. And yesterday, they also sought help with the United Nations Development Program and Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, a letter submitted to their office in Bangkok. Ms. Kariya said most villagers in her community depend on fishing and rich marine resources for their livelihoods, which would be devastated once the construction starts. She said the industrial complex only serves the interests of big businesses and does not offer any benefits to the local people. She directs her criticism at the Southern Border Provinces Administration Center, which initiated the project. The center is a main government body entrusted with tackling the violent conflicts in southern Thailand. Officials of the center claim that as many as 80% of people in Danat district approved the project. It said the complex would bring about development to the region and in the long run help eliminate the insurgency which has been plaguing the region for decades. Danat district in Songkhla province is adjacent to the three southernmost provinces of Patani, Yatla and Narathiwat which, has been, which have been hotspots of the insurgency. Officials of SBPC insisted that tomorrow's hearing will be open to people with different views. But, oppon but opponents of the project argued that the forum is being stage managed only to validate the project. They also alleged that some of the critics of the project have been intimidated. Som Prom Rod, a National Human Rights Commissioner, expressed concerns that the forum could trigger a confrontation between proponents and opponents of the project, potentially resulting in human rights violations. He called on SBPAC to ensure that there is fair participation among all sectors of the society, including supporters and critics of the project in the forum. Its proceedings must also be transparent. He said security officials must refrain from actions that could lead to conflicts and violations of human rights, while participants in the forum must avoid any action that could be provocative. A senior police official said as many as 1,000 policemen and anti-riot personnel will be deployed at the forum as part of the security measures. No, there were some unprecedented precedents in the past in which uh, this kind of forum end up in violent confrontation between the opponents and proponents of development projects like this. So tomorrow the hearing will be closely watched. And of course we, uh, we can take comfort from the fact that uh, as many as 1,000 policemen and anti-riot personnel will be employed. Uh, to, so to prevent yeah. The, yeah. the violence that might occur during that time. That's right. But of course, I mean, this is something that uh, we need to remind the government that, uh, that there are a lot of local people who feel the sidelined uh, when the projects of this scale are introduced in their areas, but, them, but with them not being consulted in advance. So this is something that uh, should have been brought to the attention of the government much earlier, that there is still some opposition at the local level against it, this project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, but uh, after much publicity, our Prime Minister Kun Pajut Chanwacha finally uh, received the highest ranking U.S. official to visit Thailand since the outbreak of the coronavirus. General James McConville, the U.S. Army Chief of Staff, was welcomed at the government house for a meeting which touched on a range of issues that include Thai-U.S. military cooperation, regional security, and the fight against the coronavirus pandemic. Government spokeswoman Narimon Pinjo Sinwat said the Prime Minister and General McConville reiterated the close military relationship between the two countries that has been demonstrated through continuing joint military exercises, training, exchanges of visits and arms procurements. She quoted the U.S. Chief of Staff as pledging to continue U.S. role in strengthening security and stability and protecting regional interests in the Indo-Pacific region. During the meeting, they also signed the Thailand and United States Army to Army strategic vision, whose objective is to strengthen cooperation between the two countries in developing and improving the capability of their armed forces. 
Prime Minister Prayut also thanked the U.S. military for flying back a group of Thai citizens stranded in the U.S. at the height of the pandemic and for the medical supplies and equipment worth around two U.S. billion dollars donated to Thailand to fight the virus. General Prayut also expressed his condolences over the deaths of Americans from the coronavirus and hoped to see the U.S. I have to see that the U.S. will have the situation under control soon. The Thai leader also said Thailand is ready to work with the U.S. in revitalizing the economy in the aftermath of the pandemic and pledged support for American businessmen with plans to invest in the country. The U.S. general arrived in Bangkok yesterday from Singapore after much publicity in the Thai media and social media platforms about what was seen as a preferential treatment for him and his delegation. The delegates were not subject to the 14-day quarantine, which is compulsory for all foreign arrivals. But Thai authorities gave an assurance that they all had to go through the required health safety safety pr procedure that includes the COVID-19 test. They also released pictures of the U.S. delegates being given the medical tests upon their arrival at Don Muang Military Airport. General McConville is the most senior U.S. official to visit Thailand after the country started easing the lockdown. And now let's move to politics. The resignations of three key cabinet members from Palang Bacharat Party yesterday represent the clearest sign that a cabinet reshuffle is around the corner. But the man who has the final say, that is the Prime Minister himself, has yet to say something concrete about it. The Prime Minister certainly has not ruled out a cabinet reshuffle, but still refuses to commit to a time frame. General Prayut has refused to be drawn into discussing when or how he will reshuffle the cabinet, especially on whether the three cabinet members who resign from the Palang Pachara Party will be replaced. Finance Minister Uttama Samanajon, Energy Minister Sontila Sontiji Rabong, and Higher Education, Science and Innovations Minister Suvit Mesinsi, as well as Deputy Secretary General of the Prime Minister's Office, Gopsak Prutakun, resigned from the party yesterday. When asked about a, a pending cabinet shuffle yesterday, this is what the Prime Minister has to say. Have confidence in me and I will bring the country forward. That was his answer to the questions of when and how he will reshuffle the cabinet. General Pajut described cabinet reshuffle as a political way of life and said he will consult on the coalition partners before making a decision. But he refused to commit himself to a time frame, saying that he will reshuffle the cabinet when he thinks the time is right. Deputy Prime Minister Somkit Jatusi Pitak today said there was no conflict between the four departing members of Palapacharat and its leadership. He also refused to comment on a pending cabinet reshuffle, saying that it's up to the Prime Minister to decide. Somkit is known to have closed connections with the three cabinet members and Gopsak and has been openly defending their performance. Of course, it's no secret that the faction that forced the recent leadership change in the Palang Bacharat party has its eyes on the cabinet portfolios currently occupied by Uttama, Sontirat and Subit. And of course, it remains to be seen whether or not eventually the Prime Minister will succumb to the pressure from this faction in the party especially after the leadership was taken over by his Prabhupada. deputy prime minister, Pravit Wongsuban. <laughs> so big changes here in Palang Prasharat party yeah. as well as the reshuffle, mm. whether it's going to happen or not. And today, it's quite interestingly, uh, some members of Palang Prasharat party came out to claim that the portfolios being held by Kun Uttama, Kun Suvit and Kun Sotilat are in fact part of the quota of portfolios given to Palang Bacharat Party. In short, they, they, are, they, 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 they meant to say that these three positions should be given to the Palang Bacharat Party members. And that means that Sontirat, Uttama, and Kun Subit should be kicked out of the cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely hot news here. <laughs> so there's one question. How often do we dress to impress? Uh, it depends, it depends. 
<laughs> really depends. And what about on social media? Okay, all the time maybe. All the time because <laughs> these days many of the users tend to show off their style. So when we post something on Facebook or Instagram, we often see people with one outfit per post. It might sound interesting. It might sound appealing when you look on their social media feeds, but in the long run, it's expensive and it's not even really good for the environment. So these designers have decided to come up with these these new outfits, but they're only provided digitally. So only digital outfits only. So many people might wonder what are those digital outfits look like. So let's have a look. Clothes for sale, but don't expect to wear them in real life. This fashion is strictly digital. Social media users love to show off a new outfit in every photo, but that can be expensive as well as bad for the environment. Designers in Russia are offering to create digital clothing which only ever exists in online photos at a fraction of the cost of a real clothes. Designer Regina Turbina creates t-shirts, hoodies, trousers, and skirts. Some items are so futuristic they wouldn't be worn in the real world. Others look suitable for everyday life. But all are sold in digital format. She is capitalizing on the social media trend for an ever-changing wardrobe. She says, there are blockers who have to generate content all the time, so they have to order and buy things, or they rent them only for sake of a photo. If the item is needed only for the photo, why not try on a digital item? Buyers select the item they want to send a picture of themselves. Within 48 hours, they receive a photo in the newly purchased outfit. The computer software uses the same patterns, are used as in the physical world. The properties of a fabric are taken into account and it is even analyzed if it is convenient for the avatar to wear the product. It also makes it possible to design clothes in unusual and impractical materials like wood, liquid silver or even dragon skin. The idea is that People will buy the digital item and see if it works for them. If they choose to go ahead and purchase the real clothing too, the price will be reduced by the amount they have already paid. Arseni Andreev, fashion designer, says the pandemic showed how much we depend on the online world and the fact that many people started working online such as bloggers and a lot of other professions are completely online now. And all this very eco-friendly, very kind to the environment. Lilia Mironova is neither a blocker nor a fashionista, but the idea of seeing herself in an unusual outfit was attractive. She's already paid for digital trousers. She says those real physical fashion items that are of interest to her are often not affordable for her. Also, she doesn't see the point in buying things that are very fashionable and interesting now. The business model is in its infancy. So probably that's the future of fashion. So we don't really need to buy physical clothes anymore if we really want something that might be a bit pricey, fashionable, but not so practical. Right. Probably. Digital <laughs> outfits might be an alternative right. instead of buying. Okay. And now back to coronavirus pandemic, something that we cannot escape from, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> For 46 straight days now that we don't have a single case of a locally transmitted infection. But medical authorities still keep telling us not to lower our guard to practice uh, social distancing, to wear masks when we go outdoors, right? Why so? Uh, tonight, we'll talk to Dr. Tanarak Lipat, a Deputy Director General of the Disease Control Department. Good evening, Dr. Tanarak. Good morning. Uh, good evening. Can you hear us? Uh, we
we have problem hearing you, uh, so there must be some problem with the connection. Can we try again? Okay, we're trying to reconnect with the third but okay. as, as we all know that uh, for 46 straight days now that we don't have a single case of local transmission. But we still continue to have uh, Thai returning from overseas infected. So for us, I mean, for many Thais who have been so uh, under pressure for a few months now, right? Yeah. Certainly we want to celebrate, right? Yeah, but many of the, as well as many authorities have reminded all of us not to lower our guards and just still we have still have to wear masks and okay. use gel sanitizers and practice social distancing to prevent the second mm. wave of COVID-19 okay. because we've been seeing in other countries that second wave is already there whether yeah. it's in China, Japan, in mm. Australia and we're hoping that it's not going to happen in Thailand so that is why many authorities have reminded us not to lower our guards. Yeah, okay. All right, I think we have uh, Dr. Tanarak back. Okay, good evening once again. Can you hear us now, Dr. Tanarak? Uh, still, uh, all right, still problem with the voice connection. Uh, it seems like Dr. Tanarak can hear us, but <laughs> we cannot, we cannot hear him. Hear him. <laughs> okay, now let's our technicians fix the, this, the connection. But anyway, this is something that we need to talk about a lot because Certainly, a lot of people have been trying to put pressure on the government to further ease the restrictions, right? Especially with the state of emergency. And it's become a big issue for politicians in the past few weeks. But of course, the government uh, maintains that uh, these draconian measures, the law, I mean, especially, is still needed because uh, we still not yet out of the woods. We may not have had a single inf local infection case for almost uh, 50 days, but it doesn't mean that uh, we, we are s totally safe. It is true. It doesn't mean that we are totally safe from COVID-19 mm -hmm. because many countries around us are still experiencing the resurgence of COVID-19. Closer to us, Singapore has seen more than almost 200 cases today, mm -hmm. and whether it's in China, Japan, and Australia, we didn't even expect that yeah. Australia would see mm. the new cases, especially in Melbourne, which yeah. many people believe that is pretty safe and safe from COVID-19 as well. So this would be a great example and a great reminder for Thailand. So I think that I'm, you, you okay. I think we can hear you now, Dr. <laughs> Tanara. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. We think we have uh, Dr. Tanara back. Good evening again, Dr. Tanara. Good evening, Swati Kap. Dr. Tararak, uh, you, uh, in your comments on your Facebook a few days ago, uh, you said you had a feeling that uh, Thai people are no longer afraid of the coronavirus pandemic. What made you think so? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's just a comment that um, after I, I saw that we did not really practice um, a very good prevention measure um, mm -hmm. in the recent days, um, so I, I wrote that comments. Um, I still I still hope that or wish that um, Thai people um, still um, practice good prevention measures um, at least still for um, for a few for a few more um, days or weeks or months. So based on your observations, do you feel that the Thai people have? lowered their guards and not wearing masks anymore, not practicing social distancing anymore. What's your observation? I think I think we um, we do we we did that less than less than what we what we did um, during the during the crisis. Mm -hmm. um, the issue is this um, I still hope that we that we keep our prevention measures mm -hmm. as good as as we can. The problem is is when, at the moment, we have a very low risk of transmission, but we don't know um, when it will happen. And then, if it's happened, and we still have a very good prevention measures, mm. then there will not there will be no large epidemics or large outbreak. Mm. But if we if we practice less prevention measures, when there is a case occur, there is a very good chance that we may have 
um, a large number of cases back again. Mm. Um, so I think this is a, this is a good idea is that um, although the risk within the country is very low, but um, the risk from, from people outside mm -hmm. that still threat um, our countries, um, that is probably why I still hope that we, we do practice um, mm. good prevention measures um, still for some time. It's maybe because we have been hearing too much good news, Dr. Tanarak. Maybe we need some bad news to make people aware that we still need to be on our guard. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I do not, I, I, I don't hope, um, I hope that we, we, don't, we don't behave that way. Uh, I think we should be reasonable instead of, of having, to, having to face uh, some crisis then before and after that we will practice um, good prevention measures. So what do you think should be done to encourage Thai people to be more vigilant in, in protecting themselves? Um, I think we have a very good reason to do so. Mm. Um, there, are few, there are a few things that we have to remember. Um, the situation in the countries that I mentioned several times mm. today, mm. that is very good. But um, we don't exactly know the situation in our neighboring countries. Uh -huh. And we all, we all know very well that traveling in and, and out of the countries um, through um, the land border is quite very easy. And during the last week, I think we have heard that we have illegal um, migrant workers or illegal um, traveling into the countries that um, we were able to caught um, a few incidents. And there are a lot of people that illegally um, arrived in, in the kingdoms. That is, that is the things that really concern me. Um, although we, we still close our borders, but we all know very well that um, getting into the country is not that hard at all. Mm. Uh, that is one of the, the reasons why I would like to see that um, we still be very cautious about, about the situation. Mm. Previously, uh, the, uh, we've been hearing that the first wave of COVID-19 in Thailand has already ended. Would you say is it a bit too early to say it or is it the right time to say it? Um, I think I think it's okay to say that that our first um, wave has already passed, um, and we have to. Um, we are now in the in the situation where we don't have that that case anymore. So, what worries you the most at the moment with the current situation in Thailand? Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, so about about migrant workers that still come can come in. And one of the other things, although we have more than 40, 40 46 days of, of um, zero case, but you have to remember that in China or in, in Beijing, um, they have 55 days of zero case, and uh -huh. then they have a case back again. Um, so the number of days, how many days um, that we have, that we have no case, doesn't mean that, that we, that we, did um, have really no case at all. Mm. So we have to be very careful. So what I will always say is that I, I understand that um, the situation in the countries, we have very, very low risk. If we still have case, it should be very small number. Mm. Um, that is one thing that's still, that that's, we have to have to worry about. And the second thing is that our, our borders, and we all know that we have border with four countries, um, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, and Malaysia. Mm. Um, it's very porous borders. Anybody can just cross the border very easily. Okay. Those are the two reasons that I think uh, that we have to still be very cautious. Dr. Tanarak, what do you think we have learned from the sudden resurgence of new cases in Australia to the point that they have to close that uh, Victoria state? Um, I think there are, there are a lot of, of lessons that we can learn from that. Mm. Number one is that um, although we have very low number of cases, but because the, the disease is, is very is very mild mm. and people can have the disease without knowing that they, they got the disease. Mm. So, so in theory, there is a possibility that it has very um, local, uh, local transmission at the very low level mm. and, and the disease can maintain itself that way. And one day it can, it can come back up when people are, are not cautious enough. Mm. Um, so, 
having um, the new case in the countries, um, I'm not going to be I'm not going to be that surprised. Mm. Uh, but finding the new case um, is not serious. But I don't want it to. We don't want us. I don't want us to have um, a large number of cases or have another outbreak. Mm. We have um, sporadic case here and there. That's acceptable um, because it's the nature of the disease. Um, but I hope that we we will not have um, have an outbreak again. We should not um, lose what we already gain. Uh, that is that is very important for for our country at the moment. Mm. Dr. Thalak, uh, a few days ago, the World Health Organization admitted that it has to rethink about this theory of uh, possibility of airborne uh, that that uh, the disease, the coronavirus, can be airborne. Is it something that we are worried about here in Thailand? Um, I don't. I don't have. I don't think that we have to worry much, much about that. Um, we, because one of the main reasons is that we have already be able to control it mm. um, with the measure that we have. So although it's droplet or it's airborne, we are already proved that we we can mm. we can win with with this disease if we try hard enough. Okay. So. Um, to me, at this point, um, is if it is airborne or if it is um, the droplet, the practices will not change that much. We are, we still we recommend what we are we have already recommended. Mm -hmm. yeah, now our schools have reopened and kids have gone back to classes. Have you seen anything that may worry you? Um, not very much. Mm -hmm. um, I I think the the schools. Um, have done quite a very good job. The Ministry of Education, they have prepared their school um, quite very well. Um, they have um, the recommendation on what the school should do um, during this period of times and what they should look for. Um, very soon, there will be a cluster of, of um, illness like um, respiratory illness. Mm -hmm. Then we can went in and we can go in and investigate what happened to, to those cluster of, of uh, what we call um, influenza-like illness or have uh, something like um, corona-like illness. Um, those are the things that we anticipate and we all have already set up the system so that we have a very good vigilance or have a very good surveillance mm -hmm. on the situation at school, not just for the student but also for the family and also for the teachers. So your underlying message tonight is be continue to be afraid of coronavirus, right? <laughs> um, just to be just to be concerned or to have to be still be cautious about. But, um, but, but in your comments you use the word may um, not a, not being afraid. <laughs> not being afraid. Right, right. Um, All right, so okay. Dr. thank you very much for, for joining our program tonight. But we'll get back to you for our Thai language service uh, in about 20 minutes' time. All right, so okay. thank you for, for this portion of the, of the news program. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. All right, so continue to be concerned. <laughs> to be concerned, not to be afraid. Okay. Because, oh, to be honest, we still have to live with COVID-19. Even though we don't see any more cases in Thailand, there are still cases in other countries, particularly around Thailand. Mm like Singapore and all these Asian countries that are experiencing the yeah. second wave, possible second wave here. So just stay vigilant, wear your masks, keep using gel sanitizers, keep social distancing, and do everything you can to protect yourselves and your family. Okay. You're talking more and more like a doctor now. No, <laughs> I don't think so. All but right. it's just the but, fact No, no, it's a good advice, be, a good advice. So you, only be, echo, you only echo what the doctors yeah. have been saying. That's good. And just I, a reminder yeah. for everyone all to right. do that. All right, so that's all for Thai Business World tonight. Thank you for watching. I'll see you on Monday night. Good night. Good night. When the world is in crisis, COVID and people are looking for hope and answers. <laughs> Thai PBS World is there with you with the best minds of the day. Join us on Thai PBS World tonight, every weekday at 7 p.m.
Thai PBS World. We bring Thailand to the world.